So we've seen a couple different equations for PV work so far, and one of the things that might be perhaps a little confusing is use different equations for different conditions, for different types of processes. So for example, we've seen, and we'll draw these graphically this time because it'll help them make a little more sense. When I'm doing a expansion of, of a gas from some initial volume to some final volume, so the final volume is larger than the initial volume, and I'm dropping from some initial pressure down to some final pressure, so P1 and P2. So point number one, the initial conditions at P1 and V1, and I've got another point at lower pressure and larger volume. That's the final condition, point number two. So what we've seen is that if we reversibly and isothermally expand this gas, then the work required, the work performed by the gas can be calculated with this expression, minus nRT log V2 over V1 if it's an ideal gas, if, because we used PV equals nRT in deriving that equation. So on the graph, what happens for this reversible and isothermal expression expansion, remember, we have a gas confined to a small volume with large pressure of two atmospheres. If I gradually reduce the pressure, the inside pressure and the outside pressure are always equal. P equals nRT over V. So this graph of P versus V has the shape of any PV equals nRT graph, pressure is inversely proportional to the volume. So the whole way down from the expansion from state one to state two, the, the pressure is proportional to one over V. And remember, uh, even more generally than this expression, work is minus PDV. So what that means is, is the work is an integral. An integral is just the area under a curve. So in that sense, all we've done when we calculate the work is calculate the area under, under this curve and throw a negative sign in front of it. So whatever the area under this curve is, that's proportional to the uh, amount of work done by the gas as it lifts the lid of the container and does its PV work. In contrast, for the second case we've considered so far, for a expansion against a constant external pressure, it turned out the work was just the external pressure times the change in volume with a negative sign. So in that case, what we're doing, instead of releasing the pressure slowly, the pressure got released immediately, and the, and the gas expanded against this constant external pressure. The final pressure and the external pressure are the same thing, so in this case, we drop the pressure immediately down to uh, this value and then let it expand against a constant pressure the whole way from V1 across to V2. So in this case, we're still calculating the area under this curve, but now the area is the area under this pink curve rather than the green curve. So in that sense, it's not surprising that we get a different answer for process A and process B. Let me label those. Process A is the reversible and isothermal expansion. Process B is this expansion, drop the pressure and then expand against constant pressure. Uh, it's not, not surprising that we get different answers because the two curves that we're calculating the area of are different from each other. So what that means is properties like the work where we use different equations because we're calculating the area under different paths, different uh, curves that we calculate the areas underneath. Those types of properties like the work like the work are referred to as path functions, uh, which just means that the, we get a different value depending on the path. If I hadn't taken this reversible isothermal path or this constant external pressure path, if I had taken, in fact, we can draw, I could draw any arbitrarily complicated path I want. So if I take some completely different path from state one to state two, then the work is going to be the area underneath that curve, which will be a different value than either one of these. So in principle, for every one of an infinite number of different paths I can take, I'm going to get a different value for the work. So that's kind of inconvenient. Um, and 
something we want to avoid in general, but the good news is many properties are not like the work and are not path functions. So to give you an example of something that works differently, let's consider one of the only other variables we know how to calculate right now, the internal energy. So for our ideal gases, for anything that obeys uh, the 3D particle in a box model under classical conditions, we know that the internal energy is 3 halves nRT. So turns out, in order to calculate the energy, all we need to know is the temperature and how many moles there are. So if I want to calculate the difference in energy when I go from state 1 to state 2, that difference is just internal energy of state 2 minus the internal energy of state 1. So it's 3 halves nR T2 minus 3 halves nR T1 or 3 halves nR delta T. So this expression, change in the energy, if I know what the change in the temperature is, I can immediately use that to calculate the change in the energy. Notice that it doesn't have anything to do with whether I've taken a reversible isothermal path or a constant pressure path, whether it's path A or path B or this blue path or any other path. All I need to know is the temperature difference between the final state and the initial state, and that temperature difference is enough to tell me the uh, uh, change in the energy. So functions like this are called not path functions, but state functions. Because all I need to know is the, is the states. If I know state 2 and state 1, don't have to know anything about the path that connects them. All I have to know is the beginning and ending states. If I know those states, then I have enough information to calculate the change in the energy. Likewise, we could call u a state variable. Because again, if I know the state of the system, whether I'm at 1 or 2 or somewhere else, if I know the state of the system, including the temperature of that state, that's enough information for me to calculate the energy of the state. So uh, whether I'm talking about a, a variable, just the value of u, or a uh, change in that variable, all I need to know is the, the states, perhaps two states, the starting and ending points. I don't have to know anything about the path. So there's a big difference between a state function, where I don't care what path I took, and a path function where I do need to know what path I took in order to calculate the work. This might seem a little bit confusing because, of course, we know a connection between energy and work. We know that the first law tells us that the change in energy is equal to some amount of heat plus some amount of work. So if the energy doesn't depend on the path that I take, and the work does depend on the path that I take, how can those both be true? Of course, that's because both Q and W are path functions. So any variability in the path, uh, any variability in the work due to the path that I take ends up being canceled out by an equal amount of variability in the opposite direction in the heat. So for example, if we recall the values that we've seen Say, so we've been calling path A a reversible isothermal path. We've seen for that reversible isothermal process, because it's isothermal, there was no change in the energy. The work done for the reversible path was negative 1570 joules, and the heat was positive 1570 joules. So again, work plus heat add up to give me uh, the change in the energy. For a different path, for the constant pressure path, for this particular expansion we've been talking about of letting uh, one mole of an ideal gas double in volume, for the constant external path, the work was a different value, negative 1130 joules. Um, again, it was isothermal, so the total change in the energy was zero and the heat must have been positive 1130 joules. So that's what I mean when I say all I need to know is the initial and final state. doesn't matter what, what path I take. Delta U is the same in either case. The work is different depending on what path I take, but also the heat is different depending on what path I take. And, and the variability in the work is canceled by the variability 
in the heat so that um, the sum of these two path functions is equal to the state function. So that um, tells us uh, the difference between path functions and state functions. And, and in general, we're going to much prefer to deal with state functions where we only have to know the starting and the ending point of some process without having to pay too much attention to the path I take uh, to get between them. In fact, very often what I'll do, what we'll do is to calculate something like a state function, we can choose any path. If we're able to calculate the change in a state variable from state one to state two via one path, it doesn't matter what path we actually take in the real world, all the changes from initial to final are going to be the same value. So for that reason, state functions are going to be far more convenient to deal with. 